Welcome to Adult Sunday School. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you again for your mercy and grace in our lives that you have brought us to this place and at this time that we might hear the word of God. We pray that you would help us to hear with ears of faith that what we hear from you we would receive with a welcome heart, that we would believe it wholeheartedly, and that we would apply it as needed in our own lives. We ask for the glory of Christ. Amen. Well, <clears throat> we're continuing on with our series here on marriage and family. And let me, uh, let me do this. Let me ask you a question as we begin together, and just to think about get the juices flowing a little bit. The question is this, uh, what is the Christian life? What is the Christian life? How would, you, how would you answer that? What is the Christian life? Or how would you define it? How would you describe it, this Christian life? It is not a moral code to follow. The Christian life is not a moral code that we follow, although there are very definite moral requirements and obligations associated with the Christian life, but it's not a moral code. Neither is it a set of theological statements to be believed and affirmed, yet there are very clear and non-negotiable truth statements, propositions which all Christians everywhere for all time must and do hold, even at the cost of their own blood, and yet that doesn't really define and describe the Christian life. Nor is it simply to love God and to love man. That plunges us into, well, which God are we really talking about there? What does love mean? I would suggest this for you. At the core of the Christian life is a living, vital relationship with the triune God. It is a living and vital relationship with the triune God. That is the Christian life. It is a relationship that was determined before time by God the Father without reference to our desires, our lineage, or our social standing. In John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, we read, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So it's a relationship determined before time by God the Father. It is a relationship made certain through the substitutionary death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, his Son. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. It is a relationship entered into individually, by grace alone, through faith alone, in the work of Christ alone. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one would boast. It is a relationship that was initiated, guaranteed, and empowered by the Holy Spirit who through his application of the scriptures transforms God's enemies into his beloved sons, bearing the family image. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. It is fundamentally a relationship. It is a relationship. And it is the Holy Spirit's role in transforming us into the image of Christ that we might fulfill our destiny as family members that captures our attention this morning. 
So turn again back to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. We return again to this verse, as we will for the next weeks to come. We've titled it for this morning, Living Under the Influence, the Filling of the Spirit. The Filling of the Spirit. Last time when I introduced this to you, I said I had a series of 10 questions that arises from chapter 5 of Ephesians and verse 18, 10 questions that are designed to help us understand and live under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And we looked at a couple of them last week, and we'll go forward this week. So, 10 questions. By way of review, the first question was this, why is this study so important? Why is this study so important? I thought this was about marriage and family. Well, it is. It is. But without an understanding of the work of the Spirit in our lives, fulfilling Paul's words to us in Ephesians chapter 5 and beginning in verse 22 will be an impossibility. We must understand the work of the Spirit in all of this. So why is this study important? It's important because it's impossible to live as Christians without the Spirit's enablement. It's impossible to do without understanding how the Spirit enables us to live a God-pleasing life, we'll live live in frustration. We'll live in spiritual defeat. You remember the quote I gave you last time from John MacArthur, where he said, outside of the command for unbelievers to trust in Christ for salvation, there is no more practical and necessary command in Scriptures than the one for believers to be filled with the Spirit. It's a pretty bold claim. Why is it important? Because the Christian life is not accessible to us without it. That's why it's important. Secondly, last week, we looked at this question. Why warn about wine? Why does Paul warn us about wine? All right, verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. Why the warning? Because drunkenness leads to asatia, dissipation, debauchery. And that is characteristic of spiritual darkness. It is the antithesis of the work of the Holy Spirit. Why does Paul contrast drunkenness with being filled with the Spirit? You see it here. Don't get drunk with wine, for that's dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Why the contrast? between drunkenness and being filled with the Spirit. Because he's presenting two contrasting lifestyles. Two contrasting lifestyles. The lifestyle of dissipation and the lifestyle of moral excellence and power. One belongs to the old man in Adam, the other belongs to the new creation in Christ. Beyond that, you noted last time, there's a point of contact between drunkenness and the filling of the Spirit. There's a point of contact here. It's not just the contrast of the old man and the new, but there's this point of contact that provides a contrast here. And the contrast is not, listen carefully to me here now, it is not between wine and the spirit. That's not the contrast that's being made. It's not a contrast between wine and the spirit. It is a contrast between the state of drunkenness, which leads to dissipation, and the state of being filled with the spirit which leads to a godly approach to life in the church, in the home, and in the world at large, which is the relationships Paul will take up beginning in verse 22. So this analogy here, this point of contact between the state of drunkenness and the state of being filled with the Spirit provides this this bridge, this analogy, and it illustrates an important reality about being filled by the Spirit. That's why he talks about drunkenness and wine. That was all last week. It was all last week. So, third question for new, let's make some progress forward here now. The third question is this. What is the filling of the Spirit? What is it? What is it? Now, there is no way for us to seriously get at the meaning of Paul's words here 
without <clears throat> holding our nose and stepping off the end of the pier into the deep water of Greek grammar. So I'm going to apologize up front to all of you who are bored to tears with grammar. For those of you who like grammar, you are in for a treat. Okay? It's just unavoidable for us. So let's take the plunge. The Greek word translated filled is the verb plerao. Plerao. It's a verb. It appears 84 times in the New Testament. So it's a commonly used New Testament verb. And it carries a range of meaning, a semantic range of meaning, as all words do. Generally speaking, plerao means to either be filled with content, to be filled with content. It's used that way, for example, in, and I'm not going to turn you here for the sake of time, but in Matthew, write these down, look them up on your own. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 48. Plerao is used there to speak of content where it's talked about a dragnet filled with fish. A dragnet filled with fish. Plerao is the verb, and it's speaking about content, a lot of fish in the dragnet. That's one way the word is used, commonly. The other way it is used, commonly, is metaphorically. It is used metaphorically to speak about fully influenced. Something that is fully influenced is filled, is filled. John chapter 16 and verse 6 speaks about a heart filled with sorrow. A heart, a heart filled with sorrow. It's not talking about content there. It's talking about something that has been fully influenced by the sorrows. Okay? So that's basically it. It's content or influence. Content or influence. Beyond that, here in verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 5, plerao is used in conjunction with a prepositional phrase that is um, the point of our discussion this morning, really. It's, it's en pneumati is the Greek. It just means the preposition en. It could be translated in, by, or with the Spirit. To be filled in the Spirit, to be filled by the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit. That's the question. That's the question. Now, I'm of the opinion, I'm not alone in this, so I'm not out on a limb all by myself, but I am of the opinion that the determining factor for the proper translation of this preposition is the fact that that the preposition, prepositional phrase, and the mati is in the dative case in the Greek. It's in the dative case. What that means is that the dative case is not used according to the Greek grammars with regard to content of the verb, but always speaks of, of um, influence. It speaks about influence or means. So uh, rather than uh, with the Spirit, which would be content, it's speaking about means or by the Spirit. Okay? So, let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. We could say, my glass of water was filled with the faucet. Okay? We could, we could say that it was filled with the faucet. But we wouldn't mean that the faucet was inside the glass. That would be speaking about content. But we would, if we were using it in this way, we would say, my glass of water has been filled by means of the faucet. By means of the faucet. And I believe that that is actually the way it ought to be, interpre ought to be translated here. Now, I realize that every single English version sitting on your laps, I'll say with. I am well aware of that. So you might think, well, why would you say it's not that? Well, I would say it's not that for grammatical reasons. We talked about the dative case. Also, if you do take the time to check the Greek grammars and the modern commentaries, you will see that I am not alone in this. And that basically they think, many think, that, that, that with is not the best translation and that by is a better one. That by is a better one. Being filled 
by the Spirit. By the Spirit. So, this argument, furthermore, for seeing the Spirit as the content of the filling, that is, with the Spirit, is based on a contextual assumption that the thrust of Paul's contrast is between wine and the Spirit. So if, if the contrast originally is a, is a comparison of wine and the Spirit, then it makes sense to say it's with the Spirit, like it's with wine. But if the contrast is rather drunkenness and Spirit influence, then by makes more sense. Somebody nod your head, even if you don't agree, and say you understand what I'm saying. Okay, good. Good. If I'm right, and I think I am, that the point of comparison here is drunkenness and spirit influence, not wine and spirit, then be filled by the spirit would be a better translation than being filled with the spirit. Okay? Additionally, another point of grammar here for you, in order to fully understand what Paul is communicating here to us, we need to understand that the verb be filled is a present passive imperative. A present passive imperative. What does that mean? A present tense verb indicates ongoing action. Ongoing action. The imperatival mood indicates it's a command to be obeyed. So it's ongoing action, it's a command to be obeyed. A passive voice indicates that we are the recipients of the action of the verb. Okay? Greek has a, has a beautiful way of structuring the, of, of its language, of carrying a lot of meaning in the way the verbs are constructed. Far more than English. So it's a present, ongoing, ongoing action. It is an imperative, meaning it's a command. It's in a passive Voice indicates that we are the recipients of the action of the verb. In other words, a believer cannot fill themselves. So we could, and I think should, literally render the verb as be being filled. Be being filled by the Spirit. Did not be drunk with wine. Why? It's asotia. It's debauchery. But, in contrast, be being in an ongoing state of being filled by the Spirit of God. Put it all together. <coughs> Pardon me, what Paul is commanding the Ephesian believers, and by extension, us, is to allow ourselves to be continually filled by the Spirit to allow ourselves to be continually filled by the Spirit no matter where we are or what we're doing. No matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, we are to put ourselves in a place where we are allowing ourselves to be filled by the Spirit. Okay? That, I think, is what Paul's talking about. That's what he's talking about. <coughs> Pardon me, to be filled by the Spirit to be filled by the Spirit is to live in a way, live in a way that is fully influenced by the Spirit. Live in a way that is fully influenced by the Spirit. Through the Word, willingly yielding ourselves to the Spirit's control. It's to put ourselves continually in a position in which the Spirit has free reign in our life. That's what Paul is commanding them by extension, that's what he's commanding us. Do not participate in the lifestyle of debauchery. Instead, continue to put yourself in a position where the Spirit is influencing you and conforming you and shaping you to the image of Christ. Right? Shaping you to the image of Christ. It's a continuing experience. 
It's a certain quality of life. It's not a one-time event. It's not a repeated crisis event. It's a quality of life. It's a way of life. It's how we live as followers of Christ. That's what Paul's talking about. We could say that to be filled by the Spirit is not that we gain more of the Spirit, but that the Spirit gains more of us as we continue to yield ourselves to Him. In context, where will we be called to yield ourselves to Him? Well, ladies, how about verse 22? Be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Gentlemen, where will we be called to yield ourselves more fully, continually, progressively to the Spirit? Well, how about love your wife as Christ loved the church, sacrificially, die for her? Children, where will you be called upon to continue to live in this way under the increasing um, work of the Spirit in your life? Well, it would be this. It would be in verse 1 of chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. What about... Fathers, in verse 4, don't provoke your children to, to exasperation, right? Fill them with anger. Verse 5 of chapter 6, running through verse 9, masters and slaves, how do you fill Paul's commands to you? By continuing to place yourself in a position where the Spirit is working in you and transforming you. This is the this is the power behind the fulfillment of the commands. This is why in this whole series, I wanted to back up to here and get a good running start at this. Because if I come out and open the Bibles with you and begin in verse 22, ladies, without telling you how the power of the Spirit of God will enable this behavior which is contrary to the natural man, I'm going to set you up for a huge frustration. And gentlemen, the same way. If I tell you, hey, you know what? If you just loved your wife sacrificially, your marriage would be so much better off. Uh, that's true. But I can't, you need to know how to do that. Where does that power come from? Where does it come from? It comes as we yield ourselves to the Spirit's influence in us, and He does His good work. This is good work. Now, there are a lot of similarities here between Paul's command in Ephesians 5.18 and his commands in Galatians chapter 5 and beginning in verse 16. So, go ahead and take a peek over there at that. Galatians chapter 5 and beginning in verse 16. There Paul says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please, but if you are led by the Spirit, that you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, Strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Which I have forewarned you, just as I, I, that I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires, but if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Okay? There's, some, there's some real similarities here in Paul's prescriptions to the Galatians about how to live out the new life in Christ. So, these commands to walk by the Spirit filled by the Spirit. They're talking about the believer living in such a way that the Spirit is directing them and empowering them to live a life pleasing to God and His will. Now, 
to allow yourself, to allow myself, to allow us to be moment by moment controlled by and under the influence of the Spirit thrusts us directly into the flesh-spirit conflict. The flesh-spirit conflict. 160 years ago, 160 years ago, a visitor to eastern Virginia would have encountered a 75 square mile section of dense woods and thickets that is known as the wilderness of Spotsylvania. The wilderness of Spotsylvania. This wilderness area was the site. It's located about 50 miles south of Washington, D.C. It was the site of two important Civil War battles that were fought in the wilderness of Spotsylvania. The Battle of Chancellorville in May of 1863 was fought there. And it was there that the Confederate General Thomas Stonewall Jackson died in a friendly fire incident. It had a major turning impact on the Civil War. It was there a year later in May of 1864 in what was known as the Battle of the Wilderness that Robert E. Lee <clears throat> defeated uh, Ulysses S. Grant, the new Union general. In both battles, the thick tangle of wood brought immense confusion, disorientation, ferocious close quarter combat, and horrendous casualties. Horrendous casualties. Now, why am I telling you all that? Because the Christian battleground for the flesh spirit is also a ferocious, often confusing, close quarter, continual battle that covers every aspect of our lives. Every aspect of our lives. In this battle, there is no behind the lines. There is no place of safety. There's no rest. It is a battle that we must fight, we must prevail in, and it is a battle that we will battle until the day we die or Christ takes us home in his glorious return. It is the battle of spirit flesh. It's a battle for our attitudes. It's a battle for our actions. It's a battle for our emotions. It's a battle for our thoughts. As I said, there's no rest. There's no day offs. There's no safe space. It's all around us. Yea, it's in us. It's in us. And the only way to have victory is to be filled by the Spirit. To be filled by the Spirit. The skirmish lines for this battle are many and they are varied. They are many and they are varied. For example, the boss yells at you. The boss yells at you at work. How will you respond? How will you respond? In that moment, you are now in the thick of Spotsylvania, spiritually speaking. How are you going to respond to that? Will you retaliate? Claws come out? Or defend yourself? How will you respond? You're in the battle. You're overworked. You're underappreciated. You're underpaid. How will you respond? How will you respond to this battle? You've been rightly or wrongly accused of something. You're in the battle now. It's come upon you. You didn't go looking for it. It came looking for you. How will you respond? Someone makes a joke at your expense. Standing at the coffee pot, you're getting a cup of coffee, you walk up and someone makes a joke and you are the butt of the joke. Now what? 
Now what? I know it doesn't happen often, but maybe your spouse is grouchy or irritable. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's probably one or two out here that that's appropriate for. How do you respond? You're now in the battle. You're in the battle. Will you walk by the Spirit here? Will you yield yourself to His control? Will you live like the new creation in Christ? Or will you revert to that old man and attack? You're sick, you're tired, you're hungry, you're nervous, you're sad, you're lonely, you feel neglected. These are all common to the human experience, aren't they? Every one of them puts you in the heart of the battle. You didn't go looking for it. It came looking for you. And now you have it. Now you have it. You're financially strapped. Financially strapped. And you're feeling the pressure. How will you respond? How will you respond? Your viewpoint has been challenged. It's been rejected. It's been ridiculed. Now what? How will you respond? Hmm? Will you walk by the Spirit in this? Will you put yourself in this place of being under his influence and control over you? Or will you walk in the flesh? I mean, these, these things are all common to man. Common to man. And there is a lot we could say, and, and will continue to say here, about living under the Spirit and under his influence. But I'm going to close early. Okay? I'm going to close early because I don't, I don't have time to develop the, the fourth question, and I don't want to introduce it without developing it. So we will close a little early here, which means that I'm putting minutes in the bank. <laughs> yeah, I realize that. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm, but I'm making a faithful deposit. So let me, let me, let me just say this. The Spirit works through the Word. Okay? The Spirit and the Word, they work together. You and I will never find victory in this flesh-spirit battle divorced from a serious commitment to the Scriptures. A serious commitment to the Scriptures without a deep, regular, and lifelong pursuit of Christ through his word, we are, we're helpless. We're going to be tossed and, and turned every direction. Okay. Be being filled by the Spirit. And then, and then, we begin to have both the hope and the ability to fulfill this lofty Christian ethic for relationships in the marriage, in the home, and in society at large, and nowhere else. Okay? All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time. <clears throat> This battle is real. It's likely occurring even as in this exact moment in the hearts and minds of some here that are sitting here. 
It comes upon us all. It comes often unexpectedly, even out of left field. We don't go looking for it, but it comes looking for us. We pray that you would help us to, to humble our hearts and to, to walk by the Spirit through the Word, to, to willingly yield ourselves to His influence and control and transforming grace, that we might grow in the likeness of Christ we pray it for his name and his sake. Amen.